aircraft. The Shackleton, one of the world's most famous long-range reconnaissance aircraft. They originally entered service with Maritime Air Command in 1957, providing many thousands of hours of reliable service. A highly efficient maintenance program keeps them in peak condition and ensures that the Shackleton will continue to perform its duties faithfully. Despite its age, there is still great respect for it. Captain Mike Bondizia. Well, from a purely piloting point of view, um, there are more modern and more sophisticated airplanes flying and airplanes which are far more comfortable to fly in. But uh, from my point of view, this airplane, uh, I feel privileged to have had the pleasure of flying it and flying it for quite a long time because it is the last of one of the true classics. It has airplanes like the Lancaster and the Lincoln in its lineage. And uh, although it's a big airplane, it, we do some remarkable things with it. Most of our flying is, is spent at fairly low level and uh, the Shackleton responds well. We uh, like to consider ourselves uh, as professional anti-submarine warfare men and uh, we enjoy hunting submarines. Now, to hunt submarines, to do the job properly, the whole crew has really got to work as a team. From the pilots right through to the navigators, the sonics men, the radar operator, the beams, everybody has got to work as a team if we are going to hunt and kill the submarine successfully. I'm the navigator. I find that operating over the sea, low level, we tend to be in any weather that's going, and this tends to bring us, uh, reduce our navigation aids to quite an extent, and consequently we tend to use the self-help kind of navigation aids as uh, sun shots and drifts and things like that. I like this myself because it means, um, well, it's more of an art than a science, and that's more in my line. As far as the, the role is concerned, well, I find that intriguing too, because, well, submarine hunting is rather like an immense game of chess, and your opponent is somebody underneath the surface of the sea, and you can't see him. Officer Lee Forsman, good morning. Good morning, Captain West Silvermine. Good morning, sir. I have a ship interception task for a Shackleton. Right, sir. I'll get me completely right away. Thank you. So to my dear, can we have an aircraft ready with full fuel on the flight line? We're going to fly as soon as possible, please. The eleven-member crew arrive for the briefing, while downstairs. The ground staff prepare the aircraft for flight. Captain Bondizio explains the mission to track down and photograph three Russian naval vessels traveling southwards along the west coast. Captain John Hodgson, the navigator, outlines the expected weather conditions that may be encountered during the flight and describes what route will be taken to intercept the three vessels in the shortest possible time. endurance, the Shackleton flies in any weather condition and can remain airborne for up to 20 hours. begins. According to maritime headquarters, the Russian convoy is about four hours flying time away, and naval intelligence is anxious to receive as much information as possible about the vessels.
the pit and cut my base, no chips out down there. The all-important pre-flight checks and last adjustments to all the complex systems that will keep the aircraft functioning normally. Electronics, navigation equipment, engines, fuel flow, and dozens more. Okay, last check complete, Captain. After takeoff, the aircraft comes under the direct control of Maritime Headquarters at Silvermine. Uh, this is Charlie Papa. You are airborne 0700 Zulu. Over. Silvermine, the vast underground operational control center near Cape Town. Electronic eyes and ears feed information to the computer keeping a constant watch on the Shackleton's progress. Employing the unique facilities of this locally developed system, the aircraft's position will always be known. To explain, Major Derek Page. Indicated on the screen, we have the map of Africa. At any one time, we can see the amount of shipping passing around the Cape Coast. Out of the array of shipping that we have on the Cape Coast, we can, as we in the case of the Shackleton, search out individual vessels. We have now the estimated position on the computer of the three vessels together with the position of the Shackleton at this time. We are at any one stage able to establish the route of the aircraft and here we have an indication of the aircraft's route to its search area and the route returning to Cape Town. Six hundred nautical miles over the Atlantic the Shackleton nears its objective. Captain Radar, contact 340 at 20 miles. Turning on, action stations, action stations, go. The crew prepare for interception. Three ships, a small convoy, but the implications are awesome. The vessels are representative of the ever-increasing Russian naval activity in these waters. But no vessel will go unnoticed. Maritime Air Command is always on the alert, photographing and gathering the vital information required by naval intelligence. What's the weather like outside at the moment? This is about eight miles. Okay, Captain, radar, target, one, clock, five miles. Roger. Roger, got a visual. Okay, now, six, six, five, eight. Oh, Roger, I've got a visual now. Okay, we're going in, beam stand by, and we shall run, we'll bring him down the port side. Roger. And the show run will be made from about 400 feet. They are correct. Roger. Okay, we're going below 500 feet. Burn bombs in my west. And then, uh, I'm stepping out a little bit. The camera is ready. The nose and coming through to you now. 
the long-range research ship Bashkiria. An Amor class naval support and supply vessel, TM 129. And a formidable guided missile carrier. The cruiser Marshal Voroshilov. And with uh, Captain. Captain Radio, we just received a message from Silverman. We can return to base. Uh, Roger, Radio, I acknowledge we're returning to base. The results of the mission are now discussed at the debriefing. Well, chaps, <coughs> mission seems to have been reasonably successful. One of the little points I want to mention, crew procedure, is just uh, we want to wind up a little bit quicker, I think, and crisp the getaway. But luckily, uh, we managed to get off on time. Um, nice rations, of course. Good meal on the way out. Enjoyed that. What seemed to be the trouble with the, uh, with the radio initially? On the ground, the comms weren't too good, but once we were able, it was okay. I also want to talk to Silverman about the position of that ship. I thought it was a little bit out, but further north than, than we expected it. But don't be too hard on Silverman, Captain. Um, it was in the area, and their, their position was a few days old, so I think they did pretty well, really. Pictures all right? Gentlemen, here we have the latest photograph from the Shackleton sortie. The photograph of the cruiser, a very well done photograph. Comparing it with our reference, there doesn't seem to be any drastic changes, yeah, specifically in the aerials. Are there any observations? Just this uh, radar aerial here, yeah. was there any difference in that one at all? I don't think so. On the photograph, you'll notice, I think, from the angle, that the aerial array is a bit darker than the one on our reference. You'll notice also that the guns aren't pointing at the aircraft at all. I have told you something about Maritime Air Command, its functions and equipment but I haven't mentioned my most valuable asset, and that is the men who it is my privilege to command. Maritime Air Command can be relied upon to do its task in safeguarding the Republic shores. The safeguarding of the Republic shores, helping to ensure that the Cape Sea route remains open to the vessels of the world in a spirit of freedom and goodwill. Not just an ideal, but an obligation undertaken by the officers and men of South Africa's Maritime Air Command.